Hey 302, I'm Jackie Ferris coming to you virtually to talk this week a little bit about Salvador Dali. We're going to head over to the Biggs Museum of American Art and talk a little bit about how this artist was controversial at the time, led the way, and then ultimately got kicked out of his own art form. It's a fascinating half hour. Stay tuned. The 302 is headed your way. K302, we are talking about one of the most controversial and prolific artists of his time. I'm speaking about Salvador Dali and a new exhibit at the Biggs Museum of American Art called Life and Death in the Visions of Salvador Dali. And of course, we're joined by curator Ryan Grover. Thank you for joining us, Ryan. Thank you for so much for having me, Jackie. Now, this is such an amazing exhibit in that it covers so much ground of an artist who has done just so much. Can we kind of dig into, um, I guess, an overview of what we're gonna see when we come out to check out this exhibit? Sure, the exhibit is, um, is quintessentially uh, a, two sets of fine art prints that Dolly created for two different publications. When I was doing research for this show, um, I found out that Salvador Dolly was, uh, you know, in addition to like painting and architecture and sculpture and all these other art forms that he really mastered, he also did about 1500 fine art prints during his lifetime. And most of those were for book projects. And so what we have here with almost 150 prints is really 10% of all the prints he created during his lifetime. It's really an astounding show. You know, when people come and see it, I mean, they really need to have a little bit of history behind it to kind of understand. Exactly. Sure. I don't want to use the word quirky, but he kind of was, he did his own thing and broke a lot of rules. So let's talk about who he was as a person and an artist. So I think that Quirky is a perfect way to be able to describe Salvador Dali. He is, um, he's a little bit of a nut. Um, and he did some amazing, amazing works. Um, one of the things that I always try and remember when, I, when I'm thinking about Salvador Dali is that he really came to prominence, prominence just after the First World War. And like a lot of different artists in Europe after the wars, the people that had sort of been firsthand audiences to the horrors of World War I and to the, the, the absurdity of what happened to those governments and the people in those countries, they started, those artists started to create visual languages to help them understand what was quintessentially one of the craziest times in human history. And so surrealism, just like other art movements like Dada, really sort of emerged in that period between the wars to help, uh, help artists and help the public in a way to try and put their heads around what was just such a crazy, crazy time. And so Salvador Dali becomes a part of a group called the Surrealists. And these are writers, musicians, and visual artists that use um, totally identifiable subject matters, but in totally bizarre, fantastic, um, and sometimes really unsettling ways. Now, he had a, a habit of using things that uh, were unconventional, like um, he used locusts, and he used flies, and he used, because he really wanted to drive home themes and symbolisms in these dreamlike images that were that he created both on canvas and in sculptures and paintings. Salvador Dali was uh, really drawn to subject matter that unsettled him, that made him um, uncomfortable to his core, that made him um, react in really sort of unusual ways, uh, really difficult subjects that he was dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And he really, um, he allowed those subjects to really dominate a lot of his artwork. So especially the earliest works deal a lot with death, about um, violence and, um, they, 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 as a young man coming to uh, grips with his own, um, with his own life, his own sexuality, the relationship that he gets within with his wife, um, he, they're, they're, 
he is dealing with a lot of very mature subject matter, but he approaches it with just this kind of frivolity and this playfulness that comes through with surrealism. So it becomes kind of, um, it's, it, it, he almost makes these unimaginable subjects really approachable in very unusual ways. Yeah, I guess he's mostly known for one of his most famous paintings, the melting clocks, the persistence of memory. Um, mm -hmm. and that's early, but his work really changes um, as he gets older because of a conversion to Catholicism. Can you talk a little bit about the shift in what we see as far as his work? So the surrealists, the painters and musicians and the writers especially that he had been um, so connected with in like the 1920s and especially in the 1930s, they kind of kicked him out of the club. Um, he was uh, politically um, more middle of the road than a lot of his surrealist counterparts um, who were much more liberal and um, he did not act out against the Franco regime that took over his homeland of Spain. And because he was so apolitical at a time when other individuals felt they had to really sort of strengthen up their, um, their sort of uh, political oppositions to fascism, they, um, the, he was sort of kicked out of the surrealists. And after a period of time, he really starts to explore less about the subject matter of surrealism that he became so prominently, that he displayed so prominently in his early career. And he really started to move more into realms of mysticism and even Catholic iconography. All righty, and we're going to talk more about the new exhibit at the Biggs Museum of American Art and Salvador Dali when we return. We'll be right back. I'm Kim, the owner of Cakes by Kim in Wilmington, Delaware, and the 302 is so sweet. Woo! So Ryan, you were saying before we took a break that uh, Dali was kind of kicked out of the club because he wanted to do something new. And he really, in addition to changing his style, he also had more than one medium, right? Right, absolutely. Um, he's best remembered as a painter and he really excelled most within the painting. He had a very sort of classical, almost kind of romantic painting style um, that was really approachable to a great number of individuals, which was interesting because right, he, his contemporaries were people like Cubis, like uh, Pablo Picasso and other individuals that were really dealing with abstraction. And, um, and while Dali really sensationalized his figures, you know, um, elongating the legs of elephants, and like you said earlier, like melting clocks and skeletons and people on these giant crutches and just wild imagery, but it's always really identifiable. Um, all, you can always make out his subject matters in one way or another. Um, so He did everything. Absolutely. Um, uh, Salvador Dali was a showman, uh, even uh, more importantly than being a painter. His lifestyle was really the, the root of his art form. And so when he was able to, when people would ask him to, he would do illustrations for books. He would do theater design. He designed cars. He had one car, I think it was a VW Bug that was completely covered in AstroTurf. Um, literally grass growing from the roof of his car. It was to totally fun stuff. Um, he did architectural design, jewelry, sculptural designs, parks. Um, I mean, you name it, he put his hand to just about any kind of art form that uh, was out there. And as a result, he left us thousands of objects to consider in terms of his career. It's, um, you know, he, like I said earlier, he was best known for his paintings, but it actually doesn't have a huge number of paintings out there. It's these other art forms that you're more likely able to see on a day-to-day -day basis. Now let's talk a little bit about um, some of the images that are in the, the show. Um, La Chance de Maldoror or the Song of the Maldoror. Can you tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Sure. So, so this was an epic poem. It was a publication that was done in the end of the 1800s by the Count de Lautremont, um, and very funny sort of name. But um, he, the, the Count de Lautremont in Paris, was writing um, books that would eventually, they, they didn't have a huge amount of following when they were first published, but the Surrealists of the 1920s and 1930s totally got into them, and they revived him. And so it was actually Pablo Picasso that put Salvador 
Salvador Dali forward as the possibility of illustrating a republishing or a reprinting of the songs of Maldroir, um, which are those illustrations that we have on view here at the museum. And it's really interesting when you look at them, one of the images that you sent over for this discussion looks like it's a half man, half skeleton. It's kind of interesting yeah. the way it's put together. What is he trying to say in this? Well, I, I feel like, um, you know, these illustrations are interesting because they don't necessarily reflect the action of the book that they were illustrating. They, uh, um, they really are just sort of like dips into Salvador Dali's own conscious thinking, his own subconscious um, idealization of these images. And so, and he's, this is still really early in his career. I think these were published in 1934. So he is still very much dealing with that post-war kind of trauma, if you will, that kind of imagery is still in his mind. And he is really, as an artist, he's very much in his darkest days at this point. He, he was also probably at his most sensational in terms of his overall lifestyle. So he was making news, he and his wife Gala were, and his muse Gala were, um, uh, on the fronts of newspapers and magazines all over the world for these lavish, crazy parties, for these um, wild exploits, these incredible, um, uh, just sort of lascivious lifestyle that the two of them were publicly exhibiting. Um, and, it, and I think that it was meant to sort of propel sales and to get a following and just to sort of be this kind of bad boy of the art world. Um, but the images that he created at this time really reflect this lifestyle, the craziness of those um, early years, as well as the, the difficulty that so much of the culture around him was experiencing coming out of World War I. Now, another image um, that's of note is uh, from the Divine Comedy. And this is really mm -hmm. gorgeous, where it looks like people praying and possibly an ascension into heaven. And this comes at a time when he has made the conversion and spirituality is really in the forefront of his mind. Can you talk a little bit about this image? Sure. So this is many years later. So this is around 1960 when this publication was first presented to him. So the Italian government was getting ready for a major anniversary anniversary for the first um, of uh, to commemorate the printing of the Divine Comedy, another epic poem. But then it had been produced in Italy, and it was one of the one of the quintessential sort of classical texts of the early Renaissance. And so. Um, this had been such a um, such a uh, such a focal point in Italian literature that the government of Italy was going to reissue this publication, and they asked Salvador Dali if he would be interested in doing a um, an il to illustrate this particular uh, reprinting, and he jumped at the opportunity. So it was like um, an epic poem broken up into a hundred individual. Um, uh, and 100 individual sections and each section would have had its own illustration. And at the time, what Salvador Dali was considering to do for this book would have made this the most expensive book probably ever produced in America or in, in, in world history. I mean, it was just incredible the amount of work that they put into this. Eventually, he started up on the watercolors that would eventually become these illustrations. But in the meantime, because of his sort of his background, um, he became sort of a controversial choice to the Italian people. And eventually he was sort of dropped as the illustrator of this new book, of this new publication. Um, however, he went moved forward with the print project anyways. So those watercolors were then cut into a series of thousands of wood block prints. So like um, pieces of wood that are carved to be able to print different colors in every image that you have, all 100 images. And some of these images took like 30 individual blocks to produce. I mean, it's just incredibly labor intensive process for printing. But you still get the aesthetic of looking like original watercolors, which is just really, really, it's just delightful and really luscious and really, um, just really, really exciting to see. And so this massive print portfolio was produced around the Divine Comedy. And, um, and it's just, it's incredible. It, when you come to see this show, you should definitely spend a little time or expect to spend a little time to just take it all in because it's just so luscious. I know that people are really going to enjoy it. And we're going to talk more about the exhibit when we return.
Hi, I'm Joseph Ojanowski, president of PM Hotel Group, and you're watching The 302. Welcome back. We're talking to Ryan Grover from the Biggs American Museum for Art about Salvador Dali. And you have a lot of um, uh, things happening coming up in the next couple of months. But connected to Dali, you have Dali Days. What are those? Oh, so Dali Days. Um, typically, we will have, um, during the holiday season, we would typically have all sorts of like, you know, Christmassy, New Year'sy kinds of activities activities happening around the museum. Because we expected low turnout this year, just with COVID, we've decided that we're going to do all of our programming online and make it available in that capacity. So instead of our traditional holidays, we are doing Dolly Days. And Dolly Days is really a series of small scale workshops and sort of activities um, geared towards kids and the family that they will be able to learn about um, art, artist techniques and the use of symbolism in the Salvador Dali exhibition, but they'll be able to do it online with lessons, or if they want to, they can also pick up supplies here at the museum. Just a quick dip in and grab your um, big old bags of Biggs art, I think it is, um, sort of a tagline that we put. It's basically just a free bag of art supplies that we send home for kids to be able to do these kinds of activities at home, and they drop every Saturday during the show. That's awesome. So. Um... Yeah. Do we have to register for this or how do we get involved in this? Um, I think that there is a registration process, but you can access the um, you can access the actual sort of um, the the little workshops sort of um, our like instructions. So the little um, the little video that we create, you can get that from our website at bigsmuseum.org. Excellent. So let's talk a little bit about what's next. You have something with Tuskegee Airmen. What's that? Yeah, so I'm um, starting in uh, all of, all throughout the months of January and February, we are going to be featuring ex, um, uh, photographs of the Tuskegee Airmen while they were stationed in at Italy. Um, a fashion photographer from Vogue, Tony Frizzell, she was became the official photographer of the of many of the military activities that were happening in Europe during World War II. And the Tuskegee Airmen were one of her projects, basically one of the assignments that she was given in order to be able to sort of record their activities and, 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 and in many ways record the individuals that were actively involved with the Tuskegee Airmen. And for those that don't know, the Tuskegee Airmen were the first, so this is when the US military was still segregated and these were the first all black pilot group who flew for the U.S. military, and they were trained at Tuskegee University in Alabama um, during 1941 and 1945. So we're talking about several hundreds of individuals from pilots to ground crew to mechanics to aviators, everybody in between. They, uh, this whole group of individuals um, within the sort of divisions that made up the Tuskegee Airmen, um, fought during World War II and, uh, and, uh, and, and had subsequently received many, many accolades for the kind of work that they did. But these photographs are just really beautiful and luscious because it's this professional photographer that's doing these incredible portraits and sort of um, on-site sort of images in, of the airmen in front of their planes with all of the, you know, the, the leather bombardier jackets and the great helmets. And it's just, they're, they're really, really terrific. This project is being done in conjunction with um, the, Citywide Black History Month celebration in downtown Dover. So we are one of several different locations all over Dover that are working with the Tuskegee Airmen as a theme for this month's celebration. So we should probably watch the website for more information on that and events that are that are partnered with it, right? Absolutely, there's a lot of them, including a air, um, paper airplane uh, competition. Oh, really? A paper airplane competition? That sounds really fascinating. So what else do you want to look at for spring? Um, in the spring, we really just want to sort of shake off COVID. We want to um, help our neighbors and help our community just sort of get past the last sort of major hump in what we hope will be the last major hump with COVID. And we're going to be doing an exhibition that deals really heavily with our own Impressionist collection. So we're going to be bringing um, all these paintings out of the closets, off of the walls, 
bringing them into our featured galleries on the first floor. Um, we've lent some of these paintings to different politicians for their offices in Washington, D.C., the governor's mansion. We're bringing them all back so that we can just do this powerhouse of some of the best paintings in Delaware. And I'm just really, really, really excited to be able to sort of show all of this work. Um, so it's about the Impressionist painting, but it's really about artworks that are created during what they call the period of, of uh, sort of the plein air period. And plein air just means that uh, for those folks at home, this is just basically painting that happens outdoors, right in front of the subject that they wanted to depict, trying to depict the absolute like perfect atmosphere or condition that they came across. So it's not necessarily art in a studio where, you know, um, uh, an artist in a beret is talking about how things are supposed to come together in their mind and then put it onto paintings. This is working directly from nature, recording those natural effects that you're seeing right in front of you. Excellent. So give us your website for folks that want more information. Sure. It's www.bigsmuseum.org. Well, Ryan, it sounds like there is so much to do and see down at the Biggs Museum of American Art. And I thank you so much for joining us. And I hope that uh, we'll see you in the spring. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this time. All righty, and we'll be right back. of the 302. Until next time, I'm Jackie Ferris. We'll see you on the 302.